Hello and welcome to Video Rugby Ruckus. So Morgs and I thought there's a bit going on. We've been thinking about doing video for a while and we thought now was a good time to try and get into a little bit more of the visual medium, get onto maybe YouTube, maybe get onto Facebook video, show a bit more of what we're talking about. And Morgs, you're straight into it with your rugby jersey, mate. Who you got on your chest, chest there, bud? Uh, I got a, a polo given to me by the Billawheeler Rugby Club that are out in Billawheeler, which is out the back of Queensland on our way to Rockhampton last year. It's been a Spent a day there doing some rugby clinics. So I thought uh, I might annoy a lot of people. I was going to put a Ramek shirt on, but I couldn't find a Fox. <laughs> I couldn't find a Fox sticker anywhere to tape over the front of my Ramek jersey. Uh, so I thought I'd dig this one out. Uh, we probably picked the worst day possible to go to video with that, that isolation haircut. Who gave you that? The kids? The kids. I let the kids cut my hair, mate. What do you reckon? I think they should stay in school. That's for sure. <laughs> my kids love it. My wife hates it. She yeah. can't wait for me to yeah. get rid of it. <laughs> Yeah. It won't last back into uh, non-isolation, I can tell you that. But I've got my Rugby Ruckus shirt on, of course, available in the nice. Rugby Ruckus store on our website, therugbyruckus.com. Um, mate, what a tumultuous uh, week, month. Um, we've, we're in the middle of a, you know, a pandemic, an isolation, you know, lockdown situation for all of us. There are people that have been out there looking at how the game can be saved. There, are, there is, you know, there appears to be... A, a dire state of affairs, not just for rugby in Australia, but for sports with no sport being played. The very, you know, the very tenuous nature perhaps of the of the finances of some of these live sports um, uh, has been exposed. And then all of a sudden it's blown right up for Raylene Castle. But you're part of Rugby Australia. You've been, you know, on the journey with them. How much of a shock was this when yesterday the news came out that Raylene Castle was resigning? Yeah, it, was, it still came as a shock. I think I, I think I texted you at some stage over the last couple of weeks, saying it, it's almost death by a thousand cuts. Mm. Um, it was it was a pretty considered approach from you know all different parts of the game. It's interesting. It's almost been bipartisan, a hundred percent unwavering support. Or you know, this is Armageddon. Get rid of this CEO. There's, there hasn't been much middle ground, which is not like rugby, of course. <laughs> uh, but I think the actual, you know, the, the, the machinations over the last 48 hours it, it happened pretty quickly. Uh, Raylan addressed staff, I think, on Monday. Uh, all the staff in the unions, the foundation, Classic Wallabies, I was, I was listening in, um, you know, all the way through all the states, all the community rugby. And, and it was very much about this is the plan, this is the work. Happy that they'd got the, that, that Exco had got the deal with the players done. And then, and then, obviously, um, hearing the news last night, and, and I just got off a Zoom call with Paul McLean and, and Raylene, where Raylene, um, you know, sent a message to staff almost, and, and some of the stakeholders around the states and the Super Rugby teams and everyone sort of in, one apologised for the quick nature of it and sort of said, "Sorry, I couldn't let you know first. And then Paul McLean um, had a quick chat afterwards. So it's all happened very quickly. That's for sure. It is, and I think we spoke, uh, in our, we did a podcast, I think about a week ago or maybe 10 days ago, and you said in there that there is a lot of loyal staff in there, so this would be a big blow to a lot of people inside Rugby Australia. You, you, your point was exactly right, too, in the, you know, that it's real, there's a real split in the camps here around um, the departure of Raylene. There are some celebrating it, there are some saying it's an awful thing and she was on the right track, and I, and I think um, there, is, there is not potentially, you know, it's pure middle ground, but there's plenty of nuance to be discussed around what was just over a two-year tenure that Raylene had at the, at the chair. Now, the, the, the key um, point really from the last week that many will see as a catalyst for Raylene's departure, though I'll challenge this probably, is the letter that came from the captains. So, you know, it appears to be a Nick Farr Jones-led group of 11 captains sent a letter. Michael Liner later distanced himself from that letter. The letter to me, I think, I think it was perfectly summed up and I, was, I asked everyone on Twitter that follow us to, to vote on Peter Fitzsimons' poll on this. Peter Fitzsimons, um, you know, a well-respected sports commentator, former Wallaby, absolutely tight uh, with all the guys that would be on that list, the Nick Farr Joneses of the world, the Michael Liners. Michael, of course, removed himself from that list uh, a day after it went out. Uh, but I think Fitzy summed it up perfectly for me. And Fitzy was saying, like, all of those guys care about the game. They're all smart guys who have gone out to the business world. You know, I think, I think essentially his message is their heart might be in the right place, but their execution of that was poor. And I think I would absolutely endorse Fitz's view of that. I thought the letter came across uh, and we spoke about um, that right now, you know, in the midst of a pandemic, it's not the time to appear that you're out there for self-interest. And that's what this, unfortunately for those captains, looks too much like. It looks like self-interest. 
We know that there's been a bit of a campaign around potentially pushing Phil Kearns as an alternate for Raylene. Nick Farr Jones has been very public on that. And then this letter arrived and the letter was far too much about let's make a change and not enough about there should be these kinds of changes or these are the reasons why we think things should be addressed. John Eels came out and said, this is the kind of thing that should be happening face to face with Paul McLean, who of course is another Wallabies captain. I think there are 36 living captains and this is only 10 of them after Michael Liner's withdrawal. So that appeared to be a catalyst, though when you see the way things have rolled out over this week and the departure of Raylene, I think that might loom more of an excuse than the actual detail of why she might have departed at this time. I think it, it might be seen as a bit of a flag as to one of the reasons, but it's more about, the, the I think, that the, the, some new heads on that board, some new thinking on that board, and some new investigations into the way this is being handled. They decided that she wasn't the right person to go forward. Morgs, how did that letter, do you think, play out, particularly as an ex-Wallaby? It was a hard one. I think that that letter is looked like a final straw letter. It looked like something that comes out at the end after, you know, moves have been made in the background to do those sorts of things. Uh, it's, hard, it's obviously, once again, as I always say, it's hard to, to try and pontificate with only parts of the story. I, I've got some, some information about what's been going on, but I've got nowhere near the, the whole picture. That, that letter looked to me like the final straw. It was like almost an exasperated letter going, oh, well, we've tried everything. They won't listen to us, which, which you know, you and I have had dealings with Raylene and Paul McLean at all through the years, and especially in recent times with Raylene as CEO. There's probably never been a more approachable CEO than Raylene. So it, 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 it's an interesting one where... It seemed as though they'd been frustrated in their attempts to get in front of her and, and provide solutions and those sorts of things. And yet that, that runs in the face of what we've seen traditionally. So even the talk about a think tank coming, um, you know, I think you and I agree in the fact that everything we're doing should be about solutions based. And I didn't think, I don't think now's the time to settle old scores if that is what it's about. So I'd have to take it at face value that these former test captains, and, and a few people have said it, they've earned the right to their opinion, they've earned the right to have a voice. Um, the way it was done should have been better for the game. Uh, the only thing, we, the sort of excuse for it is the fact that, well, had they run into roadblocks before? Even at the moment, I don't think people are agreeing on when Paul McLean was made aware of the letter. Was he asked to sign it previously? Which captains were approached? It seems that they focused on Wallaby captains from the 90s and onwards. Um, you know, it, it's just hard when you don't have the whole picture. What I do say is I hate it when the game does this to itself. Now, maybe it is the, 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 the shock the game needs and hopefully we don't waste this crisis, this pandemic. We don't waste this state of flux in the game to, to, to really pivot the game and change, you know, our governance, the way we approach community rugby, the way we approach the way the Wallabies, the relationship between the Wallabies and the community game. What is the church and state? What is the professional versus amateur game in Australia? Who runs what? Should Rugby Australia run everything and the states just run their super rugby teams? Should Rugby Australia just run the Wallabies and should the states run everything in terms of community rugby? Um, I, I think there's some fat that can be taken off the bone right through the game. This might be an example of how, especially from here, as we, we restart rugby and go through to the end of the year, this might be a way of showing how lean rugby can be run. Uh, but in terms of the situation for Raylene Castle, I think it, it, you know, it's, it wasn't the deciding factor. I would have thought that letter, it might have been the last straw. For me, the most interesting and salient phrase that was used, and it's been used a couple of times, was clear air. Mm. I think that was really interesting. McLean used it, Raylene used it, that it was about getting clear air. Now, for me, that seems to me that there's some certain big relationships in and around the game that couldn't be positive with Raylene there. Now, if that's overly simplistic, uh, possibly, but I think it was strange because there's a huge list of things that she's achieved. There's, there's a huge list of challenges, unprecedented challenges she's faced. And there's a huge list of things that were, that were beyond her control. And we won't be able to judge the Raylene Castle era as CEO for three to four years. Some of the things in terms of community engagement, community rugby um, set up, um, state-based academies, some of the content around coaching development, the fighting fund, um, some of the you know, appointing of Scott Johnson, Dave Rennie and the Wallaby staff. People are saying, oh, the, you know, it's a great coaching staff. Well, how do we know? It could be the best coaching staff the Wallabies have ever done. And in five years' time, we might go, Raylene Castle, 
you know, she planted all of these seeds that we're profiting from. And, you know, as a coach, as a, as a manager of groups in business, in sport, lots of people aren't there when their plans come to fruition. And unfortunately, on the human side of it, Raylene Castle may not be there for us to appreciate the work that she's done. Um, but, you know, oh, I'd be really interested to see what they meant by that clear air and what those relationships uh, were. Is, is it Patrick Delaney and Fox? Is it some people in the top end of, to in, of town in terms of private equity investment in the is game? It is, rugby? Is, it, yeah. is it world rugby? You know, the yeah. one thing we haven't talked about, I'd love to talk about, has been pushed aside, is the way we've approached the election of the chairman. So which relationships does the clear air mean? Okay, mate, I'm going to try something here. So, like, this is new medium for us. We're going to give it a go. I'm just going to try and play a clip. Wayne Smith was on Grandstand this morning and uh, one of our boys on uh, online pointed it out to us. I'm just going to try and uh, have a look at it now. But I think, I think one, of the, one of the key things that, uh, that you've touched on there around what does this actually mean? I, I want to talk about that in a sec, but let's give, it, let's give this a go first. Hang on, let me see if I can do this. Uh, look, I think you would have to acknowledge that Rowling Castle was subjected to a more ferocious attack than basically any Australian sporting administrator in history. Um, it was unrelenting um, and I think it gradually wore her down. Now, um, whether she needed to go, I, I, I think perhaps in the long run, um, the fact that she was worn down may well have... Um, you know, contributed to it. I know, I certainly do know that the directors of Rugby Australia were concerned about her, just, you know, physically concerned about her. Um, but, um, look, I think, you know, a change had to be made. Um, she was the one that fell on a sword. Um, I, I can sort of reveal to you now that Paul McLean um, intends to go sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, July, so I think. Uh... Look, that was a salient part of that. Um, and I, I think that's one of the really key things here. One, whether you think Ray Lane was fantastic or whether you think she was poor, she absolutely has been the centre of a, of a campaign here for quite some time. And it's quite interesting there that the board also, uh, and I think Wayne Smith has had some good oil from the board. I think he's had good connections to the board over time. Um, the board was concerned about her um, and that, you know, that she was getting hammered and flogged the whole time. And I think, you know, I said at the start of this year to you, Morgs, that, this was the year to me that Raylene Castle had to show, right? She, 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 I think we can all acknowledge she inherited a, a business with a lot of issues from top to bottom. She, ended, she had a lot of things that she had to work through and find her way, her way forward with. I personally came into this year feeling like there was plenty to be pos positive about in rugby in Australia. But some of the teams, the younger teams were coming through, the Wallabies coaching staff was coming together. The alignment that we could see in the broadcast deal that she had everyone on the same page selling a whole of game. There, was, there were a lot of things that had me feeling positive. That didn't mean that I was out there saying, Raylene Castle is knocking this out of the park, right? Raylene Castle is the best CEO we've ever had. I also wasn't out there saying she's awful. I could see that there were issues too. Some of the details around the Israel Folau handling appeared to be less, not as quite as good as they should have been. My point is, I think that the Raylene Castle, she lacked the big runs on the board. And that was my point this year. This year, she had to get those runs on the board. She may end up being seen as one of the unluckiest administrators going around because if she was genuinely one week away from a great deal with Optus and a whole new way to approach the, the, the promotion and broadcasting of rugby in Australia, then she is supremely unlucky. But she needed to have those big wins on the board. And I've seen some really good pieces in the last couple of days that we've shared on our Twitter account. Jimmy Tucker saying that she was getting smashed too much for what she was actually doing. G-Rob saying she had a really middling record. There were things behind the scenes that new people came on board and perhaps weren't as impressed about her in-depth knowledge of the game. And, and, and while we, might, we can't slate all of the issues the game has to Raylene by absolutely any means with what she inherited, you've got to put at her feet the way that we're going to move forward. And I, I had said to you as well, and I, I'll reiterate it now, she wasn't great at giving us that vision and giving us that feeling that we're on the right path, at giving us that feeling that the rugby community is together and going ahead and out there positioning ourselves in the public eye in a way that makes us seem positive and attractive and forward thinking and all those kinds of things. And I think that's the kind of scenario that has left her open to attacks. So the things that she has done, which are worthy, you know, the, the restructuring, the, the, the promotion of the women's game, the, the coaching restructures, the, the better relationships with the states, the things that, you know, potentially a broadcast deal that was going to change things for us haven't been the story of her um, administration enough. And so she, she walks into 
uh, an unprecedented crisis in COVID and it has left her exposed to this kind of scenario. Now, as I've said, the other thing I would say is I really, I, I, I don't like to see the people out there saying things like, oh, Phil Kearns gets the CEO job, I'll walk away, or I'm leaving the game because Raylene's not, not you know, there. I would say the politics in sport can be an ugly thing. And, and unfortunately, I think for Raylene, it was uglier than it is for most. But that doesn't preclude us from having a fantastic game. It doesn't preclude us from getting things right from now. We can thank Raylene. And to your point, Morgs, she may end up, being that the Donald Trump pretending that the economy rise, you know, there might be a Donald Trump pretending that the economy rises there when it was actually the foundations that she put in with the Wallabies coaching staff and the, and the, and the potential for a broadcast rights. It may be that we see the impact, the positive impact she's had for some time. But to me, it's not time to despair, right? We've lost uh, the leader of the game. We've got to find a new one now. We've got to take advantage as you, as you and I have said, now is the time, right? And that's the, th the reason I said the captains I thought were wrong now is because if we, we need to get our, our shit together, if I can put it that way, if there are opportunities there now, how are we going to do it? We now don't have that leadership. I want to see Rugby Australia move fast to say, right, who is actually in charge? How are they going to take hold of that? How are we going to get those think tanks going to get the right minds on it? It's not going to be a letter from 10 captains saying change. It's going to need to be, these are the things that we're going after. Now, Morgs, what I want to do on our channel here is I want to talk to more people about what those things are. But you and I were talking about this before. Where do you think the key sort of areas that are that are really important right now for a focus are? Yeah, well, I think there's a few massive elements. Uh, where the money comes from the game. Money comes from massively the broadcast agreement and the professional game, right? So we need a model. We need to find out what's the best model to bring money into the game that can be dispersed to help run the game and also aligns with the performance of the Wallaby national team. Because we know that the fluctuations of the union flow with the, with the fluctuations of the form of the Wallabies. You know, it's, it's almost mirrored all the way through. We have injections of cash around, you know, hosting World Cups, Lions Series, things like that. The more the Wallabies win, the more, the more, um, the more money comes through. The more people watch, the more people buy jerseys, those sorts of things, right? So we've yep. got a two-pronged attack. We need, you know, what's the best model in terms of our national domestic presence our Southern Hemisphere presence and our international game presence. Now, what I'm talking about here is Super Rugby. Sansa, do we blow up the domestic provincial competition of of uh, of Sansa, and do we just keep Rugby Championship? Do we go for national club comp? Do we do we just inject money into the NRC and ride it all the way through? Uh, so you know, I've I've got my thoughts on it. I'm sure everyone does. So so how the money comes into the game, and then how the money is dispersed is hugely important. How do we trim all the fat off the game? Okay, I, I think as, as a starting point, I would think that um, in terms of the way we run the game, deliver the game, uh, teach the game to people, we need more people wearing shorts and less people wearing suits. So we need less managers and all those sorts of things and more people out there with footies and cones and whistles delivering the game. So our community rugby could be centrally run by Rugby Australia. So or whoever we trust to do it, I don't, you know, whatever it is. So you've got you know, a, a crew who run community rugby, then every, all the other money spent into getting people out there delivering. Do we get, instead of spending money on admin, oh, I'd be spending money on development officers, just getting people out there. Classic Wallabies, I think the great thing that I've, I'm lucky is that I've been able to get out to non-traditional parts of the country. And it's just, a, we have a great game. We have a great bunch of volunteer people passionate about the game. Our job is to nurture the passion and facilitate their ability to deliver the game to more and more people. That doesn't always translate to the Wallabies winning more footy. And, you know, my great mate Ben Darwin's always about cohesion, almost less is more. I suppose the best model for the Wallabies to win footy is maybe the Jaguars model, one provincial team. We, you know, the less super rugby teams we have, the more successful we are. But the, the rugby union, the game, rugby in Australia, not rugby Australia, rugby in Australia is more than just the Wallabies. It is about how many people are playing the game, how many people enjoy the game, how many people care about the game because they're the ones, the people that care about the game, even if they don't play the Wallabies, play for the Wallabies, they buy Wallabies jerseys, they turn up to Wallabies games, they support their local clubs, they coach their kids' game, they... They instill the passion for the game in their kids and their kids, and the circle continues forever. Closing off that circle is really important. And I think at the times we've, we've focused on 
um, wallabies and those sorts of things as, as the cure-all. It's a huge element. There's high performance wallabies, bring the money in. What's, what are we showing our consumer, rugby consumers? But also, how do we make rugby a part of people's lives? And, and sometimes they are mutually exclusive, but not always. So they're the two things that I'm looking at. I'm thinking, I would, I, what I would do, I think we've got issues in governance. Uh, I think at the moment, the system has been put in place that, of the voting member unions and that federated model is that you have representation. So you're, you're for, if you're a volunteer at a club, you coach your kid's team, then you end up on the board of your local junior club. What, what, what club are your boys at? My boys, they don't play rugby now, mate. Oh, mate. <laughs> They're What's in, going the, on? The NBA's got them. They're both basketball men. Oh, anyway. Anyway, so, so say my boys... Our local club is North, right? though. North is our local club. Okay. Yeah. We go and watch so, North. So, so, so my boys played at Club Valley. They played at Harlequins where we've lived, whatever. Uh, you know, you coach Harlequins and you end up on the... You know, get dragged into the juniors... Harlequin Juniors board, or you yeah. get dragged into the Harlequins Club board, then you end up on the VRU board, then you end up on the ARU board. That's you know that's the transition. People feel like they don't have the representation of the amateur game through to the Rugby Australia board. There is no better model than the federated model to give that. So if people don't think that that representation's there, well, we might as well just blow that up anyway. Yeah. So if you don't think you you should be able to get onto the Rugby Australia board from the Linfield Rugby Board. You probably could, actually, Linfield or Mossman. But, you know, you should be able to get it from um, the Hills District all the way through Eastwood, all the way through up. That's the whole point of that federated model, that the voting member unions hold the balance of power. Yeah. You know? So if that's not working for people, well, then we might as well blow that whole system up. Let's have an independent commission. Let's have something, someone that runs and delivers the game. So I'll say to New South Wales Rugby, you know what, you guys, you just run the Waratahs. We'll run the community game. We'll deliver the competitions. We'll funnel all the, all the money equitably. Now, the, the issue there is, one, you look at the, 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 the way the voting is, is stacked inside Australian rugby, with Queensland New South Wales usually as a block having a balance of power. Rupa has the vote. The minor states with less than 50,000 participants have a vote. And because the Super Rugby team franchises have a vote with their Super Rugby licence, that's why New South Wales and Queensland have that strong block. You would need them to give that up for the good of the game. And but then you'd also need to find a way to get the right people there that people would trust whatever the Rugby Australia board looks like or an independent commission looks like. Um, and enough trust in the group of people assembled to deliver the game. Or you do it the other way and you take all the power away from Rugby Australia. Um, you know, I'm just throwing up ideas and solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, case studies to come about the pros and cons of all those sorts of things. Um, but I definitely think that we have a cumbersome, inequitable way of running the game. And I, I do feel that there are better ways we can spend the money, you know, the somewhat scarce money we have. Yeah. I think, I think, I think that's, it. There's, 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 there's like a, it's a puzzle here and you've got to work out how the different pieces fit together, right? The funding, the community, the structure, the coaching, all those kinds of things. And, and as you and I said, now is the time where you have the opportunity to blow that completely all up, right? It's interesting to see both the, you know, the, well, the NRL in particular out there renegotiating an existing broadcast contract, right? So even if, if they get through this year, if they've acknowledged that next year onwards needs to be different from a financial perspective from the broadcaster. So the broadcaster saying we can't afford to pay them for the product in that, in that way anymore. It's a different world. Um, it potentially an economic recession or depression might mean that advertising struggles, et cetera. Um, and so what does the product look like? What does it cost? How do we get there? Now, whether that's, uh, uh, an advantage to have an existing broadcaster to work with or whether it's an advantage for Rugby Australia to be able to, to work with a couple of different broadcasters and say, what could this look like? My presumption is that some of that's been happening already, but previously with the hands tied in terms of Super Rugby, right? The Super Rugby structure was there, locked in. South Africa and New Zealand have both done their broadcast deals for the next X number of years. And, and that, was the, that was the unmovable foundation that everything else had to be moved around. So Australian Rugby had to say, right, if that's the... So that's where the, the chunk of the money, the bulk of the money is coming in there in the Wallabies. Uh, how, does, how do we then structure differently around that to create more value for ourselves? The opportunity now might be, well, what does that look like? I, I've, I've been talking, I'm sure, ever since you and I started about trans-Tasman competition. There are people out there that shoot it down. We've spoken to people in the know in, in broadcasting who say so much money comes from SANZA, from, from South Africa within the SANZA agreement, that if you go without them, it's an entirely different fiscal structure. Well, 
potentially that might be where we're at right now. What is the entirely different fiscal structure that might be dictated to us by the lack of travel or the, or the slow opening borders or a different world over the next 12 months? Uh, if New Zealand's the first one to open up, you're given a Trans-Tasman comp straight away. You're playing, you're playing cricket one, one day as against New Zealand and you're playing a Trans-Tasman competition and a few bloaders like right? I've got no issues with that as a starting point. It'd be nice. Um, but the point being as well, I've always said too that one of the reasons my boys have, have are, are now more fringe rugby fans than core rugby fans is because they get such a deluge of content from other sports delivered to them all the time across different platforms. And the Waratahs, you know, the flagship team for us around here, because the Wallabies turn up later in the year, see them three or four times a year maybe. They're getting NBA games thrown at them every single day. They're getting NRL three or four times a week. They're getting AFL three or four times a week. And so my contention was always, well, how, if we do a trans-Tasman comp, we might lose the value of, of South Africa to the overall pie, but the, the offering to local broadcasters surely goes through the roof. They get content. They get local content with local heroes and local teams in local time zones when, when kids can watch them. And I saw, we'll, we'll go to some of our viewer questions and comments in a minute, but I, I think Celtic, one of the guys who always comments, straight away said, look at the calendar. Let's put Bledisloe on Anzac Cup weekend. Don't, you know, don't just leave that, sorry, Anzac Day, um, you know, long weekend. Don't just leave that to the NRL and, and, and AFL with their big games. We've, we've always found it hard in Sanzar to put games where they would be the most valuable for us or structure our, our calendar so it can be the most, get the most value for us. So there has to be upside, financial upside. You and I also say there's smarter guys than I out there who will work what that looks like. But now's the time that we need to get those people in the room and say, right, what is the broadcast product? What is the community product? What is the administration product? What is the structure around these things? And my intention, Morgs, over the next couple of weeks is to get more people that we know in rugby, and we know plenty, to come on here and talk with us and to say, like, what are the core things that they think are important? We're going to do a public think tank. What do you reckon about that? <laughs> yeah, well, I think well, the timing's right because for me, it's time to put up or shut up. Well, put your hand up, roll your sleeves up, be solutions like <laughs> You know, these, these Wallaby captains, what, what our expectation now from these guys who've got, who, you know, a lot of people say, oh, Wallaby captains are in the banking world. They've all had kids. They've all coached under eights. Yeah. They've all been on local club boards. Uh, they've all turned up and, and, and done kids clinics for the classic Wallabies. And they've, they've turned up and done talks and given out trophies at presentation days. Oh, they're not just in ivory towers. That's to right. a man, these guys, you know, they have contributed over to, to the game over the years. So they do have good knowledge. Um, it's not just as, it's overly simplistic to go, it's all Sydney based or it's, it's this or that. You know, they've spent some time around the country and around the world uh, connecting with rugby all the way through and, and have profited it, um, in their own personal branding and financially through it as well. They make no bones about that as well. Um, so well, let's, let's, let's hear people's ideas. And then there's, and the think tank's a great idea. This is the time for it. The other thing is we're talking the long-term stuff. The other thing is the immediate future of the game. We're talking about a game that, that had discussions about going into voluntary administration. There's no way that at board level and at executive committee level, they didn't have the responsible chat about, do we need to go to VA? And they've decided, no, they don't. Uh, Paul yeah. McLean... Uh, as of last night's taken over as executive chair in the interim. We didn't talk about that after what Wayne said about Paul right. transitioning out quickly. I think that will be a short-term solution. Who comes in then, I'm not sure, but at the moment, Paul McLean is executive chair of Rugby Australia. Um, and, and so the other thing, yes, yeah, so what I was talking about is the immediate future of the game. So you've got yep. the very big, uh, cumbersome AFL and NRL, right? What rugby's disadvantaged so much in this situation is that we're a very international game. Now, even our bread and butter comp, uh, differently to NRL and AFL, is, is across borders. Our great advantage is we're small. We've mm. got four teams, a fifth team in the Western Force. Absolutely. I, I, think, I, can't even, I can't even remember if we talked about it, about sticking four teams in the RAS, training for two weeks. You spoke about it on the last pod, that's right. Playing, but, right. But go through it again because this is a, what, so, what a new medium now. Give, give that idea again because yeah, your point so was about, exactly spot on talking about immediacy right so there should be in massive headlines somewhere in rugby australia or in every super rugby office the goal should be that the first game of professional sport played in australia post coronavirus covid 19 is rugby forget about what comp whatever the first game yeah now i mean I, I the yanks were watching afl i watch any sport any live sport that's on at the moment 
But I'm sick of watching reruns of the OC on stand. That's for sure. You know, I'm looking for. <laughs> well, I haven't watched this show. You, you talk about it. Oh, <laughs> mate! Someone nearly talked me into watching Gossip Girl the other day. That's how much I'm battling. My wife's watching Grey's Anatomy. We're watching that. Like, wow, we're struggling. I'm going through it. Exactly. Thing, <laughs> the Last Dance was the only great thing because it's new and it was brilliant. The first two episodes of The Last Dance about Jordan. But, I haven't started but, that yeah, yet. So, oh, mate, yeah. get into it. Um, but that's got to be our goal. That the first game of sport especially in the footy codes, especially in the, in the big codes, is rugby. Because we can. We can be nimble and agile and immediate and go. We can stick four teams if we have to. Or we stick the Tars and the Brumbies. If, yeah. if, if the Queensland border is still closed, well, we stick the Tars and the Brumbies or the Brumbies and the Rebels in the AIS for two weeks, have them train, take their temperatures every day. And on, after two weeks or whenever we're allowed by the government, you play a game in front of no fans at Canberra Stadium. We, we, there's no way we can't do that before AFL and NRL. There's some global rapid rugby rules too. <laughs> mate, yeah, mate, bring the force over once, once their borders are open. Now, we could have yeah. a mini tournament yeah. before anyone or just yeah. games. And, and as, as a way to prepare, make them trial games as a preparation for whenever Super Rugby starts. The latest yeah. info is that the Super Rugby start was supposed to be August. Mate, yeah. if, if, the, if the first game of rugby played in Australia is August, that I reckon we haven't done our job. Yeah. Now, it's not, not a bad thing to just sit in behind, you know, like, like a good jockey on one of your horses, Benny. <laughs> sit in the box seat behind the leader in NRL. Let them yeah. take the headwind and all the breeze as they try and fight the fight with government and just slink out, just draft and draft and just slink out and go bang down the outside. That's what yeah. we should do. Let them be the bad guy. That's fine. But and as that's soon it, as they're attracting all that right we now. We should too, right? just, yeah. Well, we're yeah. doing our best to take it off them. Yeah. But we should be the first game played. And, mate, you can make it a possibles, probables. You can do anything. I couldn't care less. You could, yeah. you could have a, a club rugby invitation. You know, get New South Wales country. I don't care who it is. Western Force, New South Wales country and the four super rugby teams or whatever. I don't even care yeah. who plays. I'm keen to watch rugby played. And we can do it. There's no reason why we can't play a game before anyone else. So that's immediate. That, yeah. and, and then from there, you know, so, so you were talking about the broadcast agreement. Look. Even if we'd signed with Optus or Fox or whatever it was, it could easily have been declared null and void by now. So, look, everyone's saying, oh, we've got no broadcast agreement. We've got till the end of the year. We have a broadcast agreement that we're going to try and deliver as much content as we can to get as much money in through the door as we can. So, yes. at the moment, whatever people think about News Corp and Fox throughout all this, they are our broadcast partner. Everything we do, if, if NRL and Channel 9 haven't taught us anything, is that that relationship, while it's in place under contract, is absolutely crucial. So that relationship with mine has to be, right, Fox, what do you want? What will you televise? What, if we deliver this, what is it you'd love to see? Do you just want some sort of live content ASAP? What do you want? What will you pay for? This is, this is interesting too. And, you know, um, you, you'd ha I would have to think or hope, right, that if someone like Phil Kearns was having a serious run at this job, uh, which is what it appears to be, right? He appears to have made moves to do it. Then you, you'd have to hope that he has had some thoughts or plans or connections or contacts or structures or whatever, right? Some of the people on, on our social channels say they're horrified that Fox might get it again. I'm not horrified. I think what's the right way for it to go ahead? And if people are open to doing that, then wherever we end up, we end up as long as it's, you know, a, a structure that can help Australian rugby. But you'd have to hope, and I, you know, I know for a fact, and I've seen it reported, that Fox previously have been keen on some sort of a club championship. So what does that tier below look like? So you'd have to hope or think that people, if they are going to come to the table, are going to come with some of those different ideas and different structures that can be kicked around, that can be realistically talked about with those in the money and, and put together as a package that says, right, let's have a crack at something here and be really clear. And I said this before, this is where I think Raylene was, was lacking and allowing herself to be attacked as well, was really clear on what is the vision, why, where are we going and how for Australian rugby and get everyone on board. So you can't get these snipers who come out and just want to shoot you and say it needs to be different. You can't get the Alan Joneses who are just professional complainers. You get people who are actually involved in the game, can collectively bring the right minds together and get a structure that says, right, let's all get behind it. And I hope that that can go some way to alleviating a lot of the, the pain and angst I see out there in our social media right now from people who are disappointed with the departure of Raylene because they, they saw some hope in, in some of the things she was doing. Um, interestingly, I, we asked everyone to vote on Fitzy's, um, uh, Peter Fitzsimons poll on Twitter, uh, and it was running about 65% against the captains. And, I, and as, as we've said, they have, from a PR perspective, handled this really, really poorly, right? They, whatever their intent, 
and you know whatever their, their their connection to the game, which you've said is 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 obvious in so many of them that their connection and love and support for the game over years, it hasn't translated into this episode, and so they've got some work to do to to, to come back in. You know, they they can't go out there like Nick Far Jones and claim to support the rugby community. I think that's well well wide of the truth. What they've done is created an issue that's added to a problem. How they're going to help it now is is the next stage of that for me. Um, well, let's run through some of the stuff. Look, thank you for all the questions and comments on our Twitter and Facebook channels, the Rugby Ruckus on both. Um, and also we'll be posting this on the rugbyruckus.com. So post underneath um, if you've got some thoughts uh, on this uh, on this pod. Or we, do we call it a VOD now, mate? I don't know. Are we VODing? No, you're, you're the tech one. I've got no idea. Um, look, I'll just go through a few of these comments, mate, and see if there's any questions here. Just a few shout outs. As I said, I couldn't get to them. We can't get to them all. Um, just to give you, I want to give you some flavour of the different types of views that some of these guys have as well. So Seb Cox nine said, incredibly disappointing. Her vision was always going to take time. We saw the other twenties results in the Wallabies coaching team that has been put together. Things were hopefully moving in the right direction. Thanks, Raylene, for everything you did. Uh, Matt Griffith said she never really had a chance, but are we surprised? Um, he thinks it highlights a culture of bullying and selfishness in Australian rugby. I think that's a long bow. But he's disappointed in the in the um, uh, in the captains, some of his heroes growing up for the way they went about it. And there's been a, a bit of a theme around that. Uh, NZ Rugby sent a really nice statement out about Raylene. There was clearly a good relationship there. They're under no obligation to say um, they really enjoyed working with her and, and thought she was a passionate defender of the game. Um, other people are saying questions like, "Can you can you discuss some of what Castle achieved during her tenure?" I think we've done some of that. Uh, and what can be reasonably, this is Harrison Dale, what can reasonably be asked of her replacement for them to suffer the same fate? Is anything other than a complete revolution okay? Well, I think that's what we've been saying, is that while, while Ray, Raylene was not the absolute panacea for the game, she was also not the absolute issue with the game. And there's a lot already in place, or people, smart people around that can bring something together. It's, it, it's not a complete revolution in the people of rugby, but it might be a complete revolution in the, in the structure. Do you think that's what we're saying? Yeah, I think there has to be change. I think if, if we if 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 we if we you know have a version of Animal Farm and we just get the same old just with different heads on a on a block there just doing <laughs> the same thing, uh, well then it's all been for nothing. Uh, yeah. I think Raylan has done some a fair bit of work to set things up. You talked about the broadcast uh, deal that needs to be done. Well, she did a pretty good job in terms of lining up everything yeah. to be sold together for the first time. So there's so as I said before, she's planted a lot of seeds that hope that that the next CEO, the next steering committee the next board that's come in have an opportunity now to push through but i think there needs to be significant changes to the way the government is the the, the governance and the administration of the game the way community rugby is delivered uh the way our high performance teams are run all those sorts of things and you know how we get cash uh curtis asked the three to five things you think are critical for new leaders at ra and i think Morgs, you've, you've gone through that uh craig one of our regulars from the western fourth asked what are the major hurdles for a domestic comp um will nz be involved we talked about that a bit and craig i think we'll talk about that a bit more over the coming couple of weeks we might get some people on to talk to us about what domestic comps could look like or what the implications of a trans tasman relationship would look like I mentioned Celtic 334 Orion before, who, who said move the Bledisley, extra Bledisley game to Anzac Day weekend. Love it. Love the thinking of what does it look like if you could, if you could just rewrite the landscape. Um, Nelson Scoop Dale, a bit of a theme here. Is this an example of Fox and News Corp flexing their powers over rugby in Australia? Look, I, I think it's, it's, it's without uh, doubt, you can see that the, 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 from the News Corp angle and from the journalists in that paper, the angle that they've been writing is that Raylene would go and that the pressure was going to be too much. Look, they've been proven correct. Now, how much that was reporting what was going on behind the scenes or that contributed to the issue, I think, you know, you'd have to work it through yourself and, and uh, there'd be a lot more detail behind it. But the, the truth of the matter is a couple of these guys started writing a couple of weeks ago that she would be gone and she is now gone. Um, if Kearns takes over, are we doomed to stay with Fox? Well, you'd hope that anyone who comes in, comes in with eyes wide open and Morgs, as you said, you know, has a look at the landscape and, and what, what that might be. Uh, Drew talked about a second letter. Nick Burnham said, you know, this is a, a indicator that all sports administration is run too large. And Morgs, you talked about that, that there, getting more people in shorts, not suits. Uh, Joe Staples talked about some of the things that Raylena did that she particularly appreciated. Coaching resources and support, online, po uh, online programs, under 20s doing great, Dave running the Wallabies piece. Uh, Matt Durant uh, asked us, to what end 
with the current machinations, this one's for you, Morgs, to what end with the current machinations with the rugby, with the world rugby chairman election and global, will the global comp proposal be a factor in our plans? So Matt's question is, right now, uh, uh, August, um, the Argentina halfback Pichot, he's um, up against Bill Beaumont, the incumbent um, international rugby or, or world rugby um, a chairman. Uh, Pichot's always had a position that tier two nations need to be more involved, that there needs to be more change. One of his platforms that got me was we need one, a great game like Jonah Loma's rugby. We need a game. Thank you, August. No, I absolutely agree. But, but it appears to me that both of the candidates, as I've read, have brought the global comp idea back to the table. It got shot down previously, uh, largely through some Six Nations uh, strength and they didn't want to upset their apple cart there. Well, how, how much do you think that potential proposal should be a factor in the way that Australian rugby approaches its future? Well, it's going to be crucial. Uh, that, that, that chairman vote's coming up, I think, this weekend straight away. It is, yeah, um, Sunday. And, and, the result's not out to the 12th is... of May, though. Yes, well, we know what rugby's like. That result will be out pretty quickly, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, and look, it's, it's really, really interesting and more, probably more so than ever for Australian rugby. And I've said this a few times about the importance of the, of the decade to come in that uh, Australia needs to back the winner here because we want the 27 World Cup. And, now the, and the path seems to be opening up. Argentina, it looks like there was a quid pro quo. We'll nominate Bichot, uh, or I think we seconded his nomination uh, and Argentina won't go for the World Cup in 27. Well, they were never going to go. There were conversations. It wasn't going to happen. The, the World Cup was never going to, to Argentina in 27. Uh, there might be, there's been noise about Russia. There's been significant noise about the US uh, not wanting to wait for 31 and wanting to have a crack at 27. Ireland obviously just missed out. South Africa can always throw the hat in the ring. Obviously, haven't had it since '95, and the issue there is they've continually missed out. I think three times in a row. And do they have the financial backing to do it? So there's, it's not open, open, but there is a decent chance that if all the planets align, Australia could be almost uncontested in '27 for a World Cup bid. But we know, you know, things change, and the politics at World Rugby is even bigger than it is in Rugby Australia. So, yeah. what's really important is that whoever we vote for becomes a chairman. You don't want to start off that relationship by going, well, mate, we didn't think yeah, we went the other way. That's right. Yeah. We need, yeah, we need you to help us out. So I found it really interesting that Sansa, and, and it was admirable that Sansa stuck together as a block. It might have been politically smarter to let New Zealand or South Africa nominate P Show and we could have nominated, say, a Bart Campbell, uh, who people might know as a part owner of the Storm. Yeah. A smart bloke, really great getting on. So we, we could have nominated New Zealand, South Africa could have nominated Argentina. And we could have kept a little bit more Switzerland. I would have loved this to be Switzerland, broker relationships with both, both of them, um, back the winner and have a really good relationship with Bernard Laporte, who will be a huge power broker because no matter who wins the championship, he's the sole nominee to be vice chairman. And interestingly, he has been uh, campaigning for Laporte. So the important thing is here, we've nominated Brett Robinson. For Beaumont. Love, yeah, yeah. We've, we've nominated Brett Robinson uh, as, our, um, as our nomination to... Um, the executive, I think it's called, uh, to the board, really, of World Rugby. It, there's, because of that, people would have seen the Francis Keane noise from Fiji. Who, who those people nominated, yeah, because, they, because, because oh, there oh, weren't oh, enough. He had, a, he, had a, they, he had a passport in another name to, so he could internationally travel. Good Lord. Um, and we... Um, Big bit of manslaughter, by so, the way, those who don't know that story. Yeah, so... so Robbo will go on because the nominees is the same amount of people that need to go on. So they'll all go on, um, which is, you know, Robbo, great servant, had, knows our game really well. But I, I think it could have been an opportunity there to, to broker some peace there. Like imagine a Michael Liner or a Far Jones or a Kearns just say, guys, you know, forget about Rugby Australia. Go and influence the game at world rugby level. Or whoever it is, I don't know. Robbo will do a great job. But it would have been interesting to just play around with it politically. So anyway, so... so you know, I've talked around it, but we, we need to make sure that we're correct here. We could easily, at the moment, with a whole new regime, we could we could become the deciding vote if we wanted to. Oh, I feel like we're just going to... We probably promised ourselves to the Sanzar block and Augustin Pichot. Uh, he really was a champion of that of the global test competition um, and, you know, and is a vocal champion of Tier 2 and those sorts of things. It's the real balance of it's time to be equitable with Tier 2 without 
forgetting where the money comes from. Money comes from the tier one nations and, and the big rugby world cups and, and the future of money coming through Asia and, and, and the sleeping giant of the U S and all these sorts of things. So, so Augustine Pichot is not an idiot. He, he, he will assist tier two. He will make sure tier one's happy and Bill Beaumont's, proven himself to be a, a, a very savvy political character in that a lot of people just assumed around the World Cup, uh, people thought Pichot was just going to get it. Then Beaumont went out and got Laporte and then everyone went, well, Bill's making a few moves here. Yeah. Um, so this, this will go down to the chat is it'll go down to which way Fiji's vote goes, which is now obviously up in the air. But if, if, if Australia decided to break ranks, we could be the kingmaker. I dare say we'll just stick with Sansa. How, just say uh, Beaumont gets in and, and, and we voted Pichot, how that affects our push for 2027 World Cup should be worrying and disconcerting to the powers that be in Rugby Australia because it is the, I said it before, we're going to get all this right and, and hopefully be on the right path, change our governance, change the way we administer the game, change the way we deliver the, the, the participation rugby in the game, continue to evolve our high-performance systems, all those things. Knowing that if we have a sustainable game until 2027, if we host the World Cup in 2027 on the back of a 2025 Lions series, there should be at least 50 to $60 million in the bank. And that, I've said it before, that is the last greatest chance for rugby in this country. We wasted the one in 03, our expansion into five super rugby teams at a time when the global salary market elsewhere was hurting us and, and, and the evolution of the way the game was supported, was happening, was a mistake, and we burnt all that cash in, in, in a in myriad of different ways. So yeah. we wasted the 03 opportunity. The last final greatest chance is the hosting of the 2027 World Cup. We have nominal underwriting from the government. Uh, we need some smart political people with, with relationships in Canberra to, to be some of these new co-opted board directors coming in. Uh, and there are some people around that I, that I think are well qualified. So it's all set up there. First step is this, this electing of the chairman, making sure that, that politically our relationship's good with whoever wins. Then it's a really strong restructuring of the game. Secondly, blokes in gold jerseys winning games after that. And then, and then, some, big, and then some big things to come. Well, that's a nice segue for us, mate. Um, one of our South African listeners, uh, Sabu Specials, um, or Sabu uh, Midget Kiliso, uh, on Twitter said, uh, apparently Rennie's appointment hinged on Castle remaining in her position. Look, uh, I don't know if that was ever a story that um, that had a lot of legs. Uh, I don't know, but I'd be very surprised if Dave Rennie passed up the opportunity to, to coach the Wallabies because a CEO's gone. I think, as, and Raylene Castle, I think even herself has said, might have been on 7.30 report last night. Uh, or, I can't remember where I read or heard it from her, but was saying, was saying that, you know, um, I, I, Dave Rennie would surely know that things change, right? P political um, machinations in sport, people change, people move. He came on board to take Australian rugby to a new level. He's been looking at what we've got. He was pleased with what he can see. So hopefully any sort of new structure around administration makes sure that he's on board. Um, uh, Kanga Bruhaha on uh, Twitter said, uh, uh, it was a comment more than a question. He said he was divided. She, Raylene hadn't has yet had enough, hadn't, hadn't delivered anything substantial yet. But then again, did she have time to, particularly dealing with Israel Folau, et cetera? Um, and did she have time to? And I said, that was why I think I said this year was the year where you, you thought um, it was going to be interesting. Dave Ray's question was, what now? Well, we started to talk to that, Dave. Dave's one of our regular commenters. Uh, Ian Rogers talked about Rennie, but I, said, I don't think we're going to get, in, get into that too much. Uh, and then we had a long post from Ed Logue as well, which talked about, Fox Sports and the next contract and paywalls, etc., which I think we'll talk more about uh, in the future. Morgs, um, quite enjoyable to actually see you this time, mate, and point at you and and, uh, and, and that kind of stuff. Anything before we close out for today? Uh, well, hopefully we've answered everyone's questions. I think it's an, an important time in the game. I, think, I suppose that we probably should finish by thanking Raylene and Castle for efforts and her services throughout. I had the opportunity to spend a bit of time with her at Wallabies games. Last few months as GM of the Classic Wallabies, I've, I've worked a little bit alongside her. What I will say, she, she always showed up. She would show up at lunches where she was going to get sprayed by the people doing the Q&A on yeah. stage. She, she, she was, you know, I think two or three members of Rugby Australia showed up to the, the Classic Wallabies versus Classic Japan. Um, and she was one of them during the World Cup when she should, could easily have been in a, in a corporate box sipping Dom Perignon at the Japan 
I think the Japan Island game, I think, was on the same yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, so she could easily be doing that. But she showed up on the outskirts of Tokyo to support the classic Wallabies. Um, I think a lot of people in um, in, in their one-on-one interaction with her know that she's a, an engaging person, always happy to talk rugby, passionate about the game, did her best, did her best efforts. I think ultimately maybe some, some relationships at the top end of town were probably the deciding factor. But I think to a man, people who have had interactions with her at community rugby level, on the sidelines, at lunches and things like that, would say it's someone who was working their hardest um, for the betterment of the game. She did get some some small wins. We probably didn't get the big wins. And look, if COVID-19 hadn't come across, are we having this conversation? Who knows? No, I don't think we are. Quite possibly not. Um, so I suppose the, the biggest thing is to thank her for her service to the game. Hopefully um, she continues to support the Wallabies and doesn't, Revert to support the All Blacks. <laughs> she was born here, remember? Yeah, yeah, she, she was, was born here. Yeah, oh, yeah, so um, very passionate about her footy. It was funny, you know, after a loss or after a win, her thoughts on, on the game, passionate about watching the Wallabies win. Um, and so, you know, as the, as the page turns, her some of her influence on the game will see into the future. And, yeah, yeah. Um, we wish her all the best in her next, in her next appointment and venture within sports admin and wherever it takes her. Yeah, nice one, mate. I think the other thing that we'll try to do, buddy, uh, is have a if, if anyone's got a clip they want more to talk to uh, from history, history or whatever, let's have a look at this one, mate. Just talk us through what happens in this one. We shared this on Twitter. Oh. Oh, I'm going yeah, right. to share the screen. Where is it? There it is. I'll right, go back to the start of it. There we go. The old fella. <laughs> Mato. So that's that was that was Mato calling you the old fella, mate. You remember that game? Yeah. I think you're showing it on Facebook this weekend or on Fox this weekend. Well, I think I was only in my late twenties by then. I think it's kind of bit early. <laughs> um, I tell you what, Mark wore its second slip that pickup. Um, <laughs> you got a I reckon I. Yeah, I I, got, I reckon I had DC covered there. Uh, we had a chat after the game, actually. And he goes, oh, what was the story with the pass? I said, oh, no, I reckon I had you. And he goes, no, no, I was coming. I said, oh, mate, I reckon I had you. <laughs> and uh, and then you see the fu- – dead set. Probably at that time the fastest man in the comp. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rod Davies. So it was just find a way to get him the ball. Uh, and there was still a fair way to go as well. So I thought, you know, let the young fella get a try. You know, so I probably got him in the Wallabies with that. Everyone just got to see his pace. Mate, Hoyles, um, Hoyles, he said, Hoyles, he said on Twitter, Stephen Hoyles said on Twitter that yeah, a former Wallaby coach said that you were the fastest man over three metres in the game. Is that right? Yeah, Dwyer said this one day at training. <laughs> like it was, we were doing some, I think we were doing something and then it sort of went through a gap and said it like, I don't know, I suppose it was meant as a compliment. Hoyles, he obviously turns it the other way. But um, <laughs> yeah, and it just, a dead set went from there. And then, and then you know, my pre-match preparation before Waratah's game was to, to turn up the, the Chloe Hotel about midday Bobby Tate would organise a nice pass to lunch for me and I'd sit at the tab and have a bet in the afternoon before heading up to the footy stadium <laughs> to the team meeting. And, and in those days, it was, it was nothing on your app or whatever. You had to physically get this big rectangular white card into the yeah, machine. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm late. I'm 10 seconds ago, I'm still making decisions and I just have to sprint to try and get, try and get your ticket on. And so then a legend grew about my three-metre pace from there. So, mate, uh, uh, the, the speed that grew in a TAB, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this incidental exercise, it's called, you know. Nice one. All right, mate, that was the Rugby Ruckus Morgs. Good to have you on video, mate. We'll do more of this. Uh, and uh, as I said, guys, if you've got a clip or something you want us to have a look at or talk about that's on social media or on YouTube or something that we can share while we talk, we'll do that. Uh, but hopefully you start to watch a bit more of us and we'll do some interesting things and we'll definitely get some guests on. Catch you later, Morgs. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, everyone. Oh, 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 oh.